doesn't need any introduction. Everybody knows him. The entire universe knows him. I mean, the avatar knows him. Uh, but his, for those of you uh, who may not be familiar with him uh, from the Iranian community, he did a very important work for Baba. As you know, Baba's process of awakening released a, um, an aid, shall we say, in the, uh, in the form of psychedelic drugs, but just like, like antibiotics that are you know, useful for a short period of time and then they can kill you because antibiotic means against life. So these drugs were also uh, very dangerous. They served their purpose, and, but then they had to be warned so that now that they've served their purpose, please don't continue using them. And so that message was given to Alan and a couple of other people that he will tell us about. And he has been pretty much devoted all of his professional life to educating us all about drugs and how they work. I remember being so delighted at uh, being invited here. The Persian community, the Persian Baba community has been very important, I think very important in linking East and West, and especially important in transferring and translating the love of the tradition and the great masters of the path. After all, what was the avatar's name? Marwan Irani. Anyway, so you know my friend here, I think. Uh, and what I wanted to do is to, particularly for our Persian family who might not have been around during the early days when Meher Baba was just becoming known. And he was just starting in the 1960s to begin to urge his lovers to start spreading his message. Now, of course, they already had in many ways. And in India, there had been major, major press. In America, uh, we had mostly literature from India. Noshirwan, of course, kept the glow going. But the big push, the big push happened in the 1960s and early 1970s. Now, as uh, <laughs> as, as I had mentioned, I had been a graduate student at Harvard University and had two professors who were the leading proponents of the psychedelic revolution, uh, Richard Alpert and Timothy Leary. They were my professors. And we had the chance at that time to do an experiment with then legal drugs. Uh, called psilocybin and mescaline and LSD. Instead of doing a final examination for one of our courses, well, how can one how can one make that choice? Well, it was easy. Who wanted to go through five hours of exams and rather than take a, take a pill and write write about your experiences? Well, that's what happened. And uh, so I had some very unusual experiences. We knew nothing about consciousness in those days. And I do want to apologize for older Baba lovers who, who went through phases of potential drug use in the early days, thinking that we had invented a new form of consciousness. Well, we had not. We didn't invent a thing, but we didn't know any better. And the time came when we thought that we had a new way of expanding consciousness. Well, this turned out not to be true, but there is some very hard learning involved. In any event, after a couple of years working with these professors and the impact of the drugs, I was selected to be a psychedelic guide. To, to become a psychedelic guide, one had to take 
a large dose of LSD alone and survive mentally. Uh, so <laughs> I did that. I did that. And uh, an interesting thing happened at the end of that experience, which I passed, you'll be glad to know. Um, and that is, I found my handwriting on the paper and it said, the way for you is love, trust and unity. I said, what, what could that mean? So the very next day, as I was coming out of the experience, I learned that we had been invited to Woodstock, New York, to see a film of a holy man. And I, I didn't want to be left alone. I was not that particularly interested in holy men, but I went along. And guess who the film was about? Yes, the film was about Meher Baba. And some of the figures from Mayor Baba's close disciples at that time were there. Uh, Tom Riley and his wife, Fred and Ella Winterfeld, Lynn Ott, and Darwin Shaw gave the talk and showed a film of Mayor Baba giving darshan. Darwin was an unusual person to talk about consciousness from our point of view. He actually had a suit jacket and a tie. <laughs> and, uh, but he, he looked as if he, he had taken LSD or he, his vibrations were very strong and powerful. I saw the film of Mayor Baba. I liked, I liked that man. He had a lot of patience with all the people walking by. He had a sense of humor, which very few Eastern figures had. And he had obviously great love for these people. So I was intrigued and went over to the book table and saw a little booklet called Sparks. And just reading through it a little bit, Meher Baba, whoever this man was, summarized everything we had learned up to that time about consciousness. So of course I stole the book as was the culture of the time. I went back to uh, our 60 room house in the psychedelic community. And believe it or not, one of our people had some original copies of the discourses. I read the discourses. I was convinced this was the smartest person I had ever read. And it was because he was so inclusive. He covered everything and missed nothing. So I decided to give, give Meher Baba the, the test took the discourses up on a hill in the summer, took a large dose of LSD and read the discourses again. And of course, at one point I reached the sixth plane of consciousness, <laughs> sixth plane. I thought, and, and several people afterwards thought I looked like a God because I was sunburned. They didn't know that. <laughs> also, I was working at a school for the <clears throat> mentally retarded, and they all applauded when I returned, thinking that I was Paul McCartney. Uh, so I, I was sure that I had reached this higher level. Now, I, I couldn't keep it, but I reached and I thought that Mayor Baba's people would be very interested in this. So the only person I knew, the only address I had was of Kitty Davy in Myrtle Beach. And I wrote her about how to get to this plane. I, I, I told her what section of the discourses should be read, under what dosage of LSD, 
and <laughs> thought that I should share this with the Baba community. Well, <clears throat> Kitty Davy received the letter and really didn't know how to respond to it. So she sent it to India to the corresponding secretary for Baba, who was at that time Adi Irani. Adi saw the letter and he, he didn't know exactly how to respond either. So <clears throat> he broke in one of Baba's seclusions and showed it to him. Well, Meher Baba knew how to respond to it. And that uh, began a correspondence which started a new realization uh, in the West of the, both the limitations of these psychedelic drugs and the, re the reality of true expanded consciousness. Uh, in that letter, Meher Baba gently told me, no, that was not the sixth plane. <laughs> that was a shadow at best of the astral plane and uh, encouraged me to read God Speaks. And that was the beginning of really my romance with Meher Baba. The uh, follow-up correspondence initiated uh, a new role that, that started in 1966. Well, skipping a few years, I, uh, when uh, we corresponded more with Mayor Baba and our friends at Cambridge and Harvard, especially Rick Chapman and Robert Dreyfus, uh, Mayor Baba wrote a letter in response to a note from Mershida Ivy Deuce about the spread of LSD among young people. And we got basically a letter back saying we should become active, Rick and Robert and I, in spreading Baba's messages about these drugs. And to convince, to try to convince the young people away from them. Now, it was very interesting. Historically, Meher Baba, as you know, very, very rarely interfered with politics, international issues, controversial policy issues, uh, social issues. This was perhaps the one largest exception and he was very, very interested in intervening for the health, particularly of young people across the world in this regard. Now, uh, we began to understand more fully what Baba was saying about these drugs. And I had just got my PhD in clinical psychology I think in the early days, it's fair to say that we did not, or at least I did not think we, we could get anyone's attention. Uh, we were young, we were not famous, we were not published. And in the, uh, it, it took uh, Baba, for me to perform a couple of small miracles <laughs> to convince me that it was possible, as well as being uh, told directly by Mershida Deuce, you don't worry about how this can happen. You just follow the, the avatar's orders. So um, we started and it, it's, it was quite a remarkable Quite a remarkable journey. I'm going to tell a couple of stories about it. I did want to tell you about uh, Rick, Rick Chapman has written uh, a book. I don't know if it's hit the, the, the stands yet. 
And in, in this, he's done a wonderful job of compiling almost uh, uh, all of Baba's comments or the, all of Baba's relevant comments anyway, about various drugs, uh, psychedelics, even through in alcohol and tobacco. So when it, when it hits the stands, I can recommend it highly. Um, things opened up. It was then miraculous what happened. Uh, in the beginning, we wrote a letter to college newspapers. And part of that letter was picked up by a few national newspapers. Mayor Baba Lovers around the US started doing inquiries with newspapers, radio shows, and ultimately television shows. And incredibly, almost everyone who was contacted said, yes, we would have Alan or Rick or whoever come, come on. And uh, they were skeptical. And I want to tell uh, perhaps three brief stories, which illustrate how <laughs> both humorously and profoundly Meher Baba worked to get these messages over, even given our profound limitations in terms of either presentation or knowledge. The first occurred in a invited lecture that Baba lovers at the University of Massachusetts tried to arrange at the last minute in a snowstorm. And they, they arranged for a small classroom. And uh, we, they, they told us that there might be 13 or 14 people. Uh, so, I got there and there was no one, there was no one there. And it said that the room had been switched. Well, we went to the new room and the new room was the college lecture hall in which 1200 people came, which was almost a third of the campus. I happened to have a film of Baba at that time. I talked mostly about drugs but at the end, I showed the film of Baba, and we opened the uh, we opened it up for questions and answers. I began to sense that the audience, some of the audience, were feeling very negative. They didn't know about this Baba person. Some of the questions I got were, "Did he have Parkinson's disease?" You know. Baba was working with his fingers. Others saying, it sounds like sexual repression to me. <laughs> <laughs> and things started to, to get more and more negative. Suddenly then, suddenly there was a, a scream from the audience, a woman's scream. And less than a second later, I was blind and and fell off the lectern and more screaming from the audience. I figured perhaps I had been shot and quickly checked <clears throat> the number of senses. You know, in God Speaks, when you die, you lose certain senses. And I wanted to see how many were left. Well, <laughs> there were a few that were left. And in the screaming and my blindness, suddenly I had a sensation, a sensation of taste. I must still be alive because you don't have taste after you die. It was a taste of, of banana, of banana cream. <laughs> and what had happened is a man had snuck up behind me, had a banana cream pie and plopped it in my face. I was dripping with pie while answering the question. 
I was in the midst of answering a question. So I got back on the lectern and continued answering the question with pie dripping <laughs> off me with uh, the campus police chasing <laughs> the man who had just come out of a mental hospital <laughs> and thought, thought I was in favor of LSD. <laughs> and and, and uh, anyway, we let, we, we, we let him go. But uh, suddenly the atmosphere changed totally. And I simply went on with the questions and answers dripping pie. And the audience then switched and they were very, very favorable. And uh, the next day, the, the campus newspaper wrote up the incident and talked about Baba's message and how what could have been a very negative experience turned out to be very positive. And, uh, and no one could explain why 1,200 people came. So uh, it, it was a remarkable illustration of <laughs> the lengths that Baba will go to to get people receptive to his message. There was one other case that was so extraordinary that I wanted to mention it. After a while, we were doing a lot of television interviews, uh, <clears throat> including a couple of shows that ultimately reached about 50 million viewers from the Today Show to uh, many talk shows. And <clears throat> we specialized, and uh, Rick will write about this too, Chapman. We specialized in hostile hosts, talk show people who like to dismember their guests. <laughs> and they thought, we were probably good candidates for that because of our LSD experience and because we followed a silent avatar. This particular event occurred, I believe, in Chicago. And it was a late night television talk show with a very difficult host. And I knew that I only had about five or seven minutes uh, to talk. And uh, we talked a little bit about LSD. I always, I always carried a film of Mayor Baba just in case. Uh, and <laughs> in that group, what we decided to do was the Baba lovers, there was an audience. Our Baba lovers would, underneath their coats, have photos of Mayor Baba. And when the camera panned to the audience, they would, they would open their coats <laughs> and at least we would, we would get a photo of Baba out. And, and uh, so that, that, that worked and uh, I was able to say Baba's name in the interview and I was very happy. With, with how it went. We were walking out of the studio and I see the host of the show coming up and, and, and he, uh, he looked guilty. And he said to me, uh, Dr. Cohen, I, I'm, so, uh, I'm so sorry. We, I know you had a film, but we, did, we didn't have time to, to show it. I said, no, no problem, no problem. We, we uh, thank you, but, but we were very happy. We walked out of the door of the theater. The man follows me. He says, no, no, really, uh, really. We, we, di we just didn't have time to show this film. We just, di we just didn't. And, and he began to get very agitated. And I said, don't worry, don't worry. This was a wonderful, we, we had a fine time. And then he insisted that I come back in and talk to the director. And he says to the director, you know, Roy, uh, 
teledactical we, we we didn't have we didn't have time to show any any film it was it was over Th this was a taped show but it was going to be shown later in the night and the director said uh uh well uh <clears throat> you know uh joe yeah well we we had another 45 seconds but the band was playing so uh we of course we couldn't do it and the host became almost hysterical and said 45 seconds 40 we can we can retape we can reinsert it into the program and the, the producer says uh no 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 we really can't the the band uh, the band has has gone and uh, everybody, uh, it's a union band, and, and uh, we can't we can't start the show again. And and he says, "You must, you must." And he ran around. Uh, no one could understand what had gotten into him. He insisted that we go back on stage, and that forty five seconds of the film of Mayor Baba to be shown. And I was desperately trying to link what I had said before <laughs> to the film because it was going to be shown as one piece. And he did it. And later we asked the, the other technicians, etc., has this ever happened before? He says, it's never happened. It can happen. It just, we don't know what happened to this man. We just don't know. Well, later, of course, a couple of years, people would come up and say, oh yeah, I heard of Baba from that, uh, from that show in Chicago. So he'll do it all. Now, I, I do want you to know that while doing any work for Mayor Baba, he, assures you that your ego does not get too inflated. So in the midst of these somewhat miraculous occurrences, he would make sure that I was sufficiently humiliated in several circumstances. I can't tell all of those stories, but <laughs> there was one time when by mistake at a <clears throat> exclusive school for girls, in Massachusetts, I was giving a, a talk on philosophy, and I, by mistake, I hypnotized the entire class. I was so exhausted that I fell asleep while talking in a very soft chair, and, and I kept talking even though I was half asleep. <clears throat> and I would use a voice that I use when I do hypnosis. And when my, my Baba lover friend shook me up and said, wake up, wake up. <clears throat> and he said, what, what happened to the girls? And I looked out and they were all hypnotized. They weren't moving. And I realized that I was in terrible trouble, that if the faculty ever found out, I would be toast. This would not be good for Mayor Baba's reputation. <laughs> so what I did was I, I gave them <laughs> five rules about why not to use drugs. And each time I would say they would become more awake to this. And when I reached one, they would be fully awake to the dangers of drugs. And they all came out of hypnosis. And I said, goodbye. And I ran out of the building. <laughs> so I know we have, we have, uh, there's so many stories which we don't have time for and uh, we don't have too much time left today but i wanted to talk a little bit to go a half century ahead and talk a little bit about the problem with 
uh, drug abuse in the world today. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> now some Baba lovers, because of the, uh, uh, the, the problem, the increasing problem with the range of drugs from the narcotics, heroin, opium, fentanyl to the psychedelics to ecstasy to various forms of uh, cannabis or marijuana. And they say to us, well, you guys didn't do a very good job of stopping <laughs> this drug problem. Uh, but we, we said, but they're not doing it for spiritual purposes very much anymore. That at least, <laughs> that at least Baba was able to put, uh, put yeah. to rest in to this very day except for some Peruvian shamans. Uh, not, not many people are expecting to uh, gain cosmic consciousness through drugs. Having said that, there are many families of Baba lovers across the world who have had problems, particularly with their children using drugs, uh, getting uh, addicted very quickly to some very serious drugs, certainly uh, using marijuana and uh, other drugs. Um, we have lost several young people who have died, Baba lover kids who have died from overdoses. Mm. And the issue is getting more and more uh, difficult. In the United States, there has been a move to legalize the use of marijuana and its other products. And uh, around the world, there are various uh, cultural problems. I know Iran has had an active uh, drug abuse research uh, committees. Uh, opium is, is, has been an increasing problem. Uh, wherever you go, a lot of parents are very, very concerned. And uh, we're trying to keep as much on top of this as we can. What I especially wanted to talk about was Meher Baba as the great neuroscientist. <laughs> so, uh, when we look back at what Mayor Baba said about drugs, what we'd learned is that he knew, I mean, it sounds like he's obvious, but he really knew. He knew the neurological and toxicological mechanisms of how these drugs worked and what they affected. Uh, everything that he said and every distinction he made has been proven by science. Uh, I'll give a couple of examples on both sides. One, he understood uh, people did not take hashish or marijuana or cannabis seriously uh, for many, many years. He understood that there was a chemical in the cannabis plant called delta 9 trans tetrahydrocannabinol, which had this kind of hallucinogenic effects uh, on consciousness, similar, but not exactly to LSD, but also that it interfered significantly with the endocannabinoid system in the brain and could be extremely deleterious and could last in the body for a long time. I won't go into the details now, but that's one example of his specific knowledge. On the other hand, he said that uh, some, some of the psychedelics could be used medically. And the two things he talked about specifically were depression and alcoholism. And recently, there's been some responsible researchers who have found out that with, in conjunction with therapy, uh, LSD and psilocybin in particular could be used 
to assist in depression. And they're just beginning to research the use in terms of alcoholism. He named it right back then. And he knew exactly what the, and he said that it's going to be important to understand its effects on physical health, on mental health, and just began to hint about the damage to the connection between the physical body and the astral body. Uh, in terms of mental health, there is now a huge amount of research that all the drugs he talked about increase the long-term probability of psychotic experience, for example. Uh, schizophrenia, severe depression, increase in suicides and anxiety. And that in fact, uh, as after Farhad, uh, uh, I wanna mention, Meher Baba's last most statements uh, about the use of drugs and why he, and how he nailed the specific difficulties with these drugs. Mayor Baba made a, made a statement uh, in the film that Louis van Gastren made that ap can, applies to and can be understood by every drug user. And that is, no matter how much you like it, it is temporary. It is temporary. You cannot hold it. Even the best experience you cannot hold. And if you like your experience on drugs, you will dislike more your experience in life. That is the rule of pain and pleasure. That is the rule of duality. Meher Baba did not talk quite as much uh, about his understanding of what happens to the energy transfer between the subtle body and the physical body. We have ample proof, which we, we cannot broadcast very credibly, that these drugs tend to punch holes in, if you will, the natural barriers between the astral world and the physical world. And that many uh, experiences uh, ranging from what we might call spirit possession to the real inability of people to retain their cognitive ability and to be able uh, and to be open to anxiety that seems not to be related to their childhood or other things. That, uh, that's a problem over and above the physical and mental health problems. So he well, Baba well knew about this. And he knew that the world was going to be struggling with this issue for a long time. So what we want to express about Mayor Baba's views is not the issue of morality of, it's, it's not the same as being a vegetarian or not a vegetarian, which he doesn't care about. This is a case of uh, an actual observable and provable harms that prevent numbers of people from accepting the new divine force of the new humanity. They can't do it. Uh, they may have to be removed in terms of their ordinary lifetimes. That is, they can't really fill their potential and they certainly can't participate in the essence of the new humanity which after all, 
after all, if you look at all of what Baba says on how best to love him and what he wants, what it means is you have to live in the world and love. Uh, Aldous Huxley, the philosopher said, he said, you know, everything I've studied, all I can say about spirituality, et cetera, to people is to be kind. So if you can't function well in the world, it is very, very difficult to apply the principles of love and unity uh, that, that Meher Baba wishes. You know, Maya, Maya is Maya. The, the universe is resisting this change. People's egos are resisting this change because Meher Baba is into destroying the limited ego. The limited ego does not like this. And in some cases, the drugs perform a function of allowing them to forget that they have to deal with uh, their, both their lower desires, their anxiety, their depression, etc. cetera. So um, you take Meher Baba's views, not as shoulds, you should not do this because God wouldn't be pleased with you. It's, you should not do this because it doesn't help you come closer to him. It doesn't, it doesn't help you to be connected with those forces which are going to help out the new humanity. And he's particularly concerned with children because these drugs are so addicting and dependence forming that it's very, very difficult for them to uh, break these habits. It's very important for, for Baba parents to be very, very perceptive of what's going on with their children and particularly what's going on with their peers as they begin to come to adolescence. And don't be fooled by thinking that all the, all the kids in the Baba families are, uh, are immune. They're not. And it's very important to keep one's eye on this. Jay Baba, Jay Baba. thank you for uh, um, giving everybody such a beautiful uh, advice and also uh, talking about Baba. And I'm sure everybody uh, enjoy. And also the, the question I have for, um, for you is, what kind of advice can you give the parents of Baba Lover for their children? That, Nazreen, you, you have just almost generated a book about that. There, <laughs> uh, uh, in fact, we, uh, back in 1975, we wrote a book called Understanding Drug Use in Adults Guide to Drugs of the Young. I think the big thing is to uh, share, if they're interested in Baba, to share what he said and not to be shy at all about asking about how they feel about the drugs and particularly what is happening with their peer group. It's almost always a fact that uh, people will not be taking, the kids will not take these drugs by themselves. It's always with friends. And uh, that's something to watch out for. So one thing to be done in that case is to talk to their other parents. Uh, there are many professionals that can help with uh, educating kids about this. And one shouldn't feel helpless. Uh, for this particular group, and uh, I think uh, folks will be able to get in touch with me easily, I think. Uh, I would be happy to help out in any particular case and refer you to possibilities. Uh, we're gonna try to set up some networks of ongoing information about this. There are beginning to become school, really good school-based education and some, also some videos that are very good for kids about this. Uh, 
we'll see what happens. I'm going to be chatting later this month with uh, children uh, in Philadelphia in a regular Baba group there. You'd be surprised how aware they are of what's going on. You'd really be surprised. Fifth graders, sixth graders, they're very, very aware nowadays. Mm-hmm. So we'll, we'll keep looking at uh, kind of the best materials and the best resources. And uh, we, you know, we know that, that Bob is going to uh, provide us with what we really need. And, uh, you know, I, uh, it, it, everybody has crises in their lives. And Baba lovers particularly, during this period, I have never seen as much stress on Baba lovers and their children as I have in the last 50 years. Uh, and, and by the way, psychiatric drugs are all right if medically prescribed, which uh, they're just an, uh, another assist. In There's so much stra- energy coming through uh, that our, our, our bodies and our minds have to bend and stretch with it. We just can't keep hold of our old selves. And so things are cropping up that uh, in, in past years has not bothered us particularly or bothered our children. And it's happening now. So, but, but it's a manifestation of Baba's love and energy. Uh, hey, if he can disintegrate a couple of egos on the way, no problem. <laughs> Is he serious about that? I mean, if you follow Baba, what did he say? There is no, there is no peace of mind on this path. Uh, if you want peace of mind, go for walks, listen to music, take drugs, <laughs> see saints, but you're not, <laughs> not on this path. This yeah. is tough. You may, you may save a thousand lives and it's worth it. And it's worth every second of the struggle to put Baba at at your heart and your ego, uh, at least hopefully following. But it is a, uh, a powerful time and it's not an easy time, uh, but it's certainly challenging. And uh, uh, it's very amusing on occasion. The ego is very funny and uh, loves, to, loves to, to play back, but uh, Baba has the upper hand. But Nazan, thank you for your question very much and we'll we'll try to keep the network of information going when when, as we need it wonderful thank you so much thank you well basically uh, my question is uh, about uh, particularly the millennial generation and the Mm -hmm. use of drugs Mm -hmm. Uh, we did talk about uh, you mentioned about some of the crises or challenges that Boba Lover families now yes. have with their children. Yes. And according to your observation and practice, that has increased dramatically yeah. recently. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd like to also add that, you know, Boba Lover kids are no different than the kids in the world or this particular generation that has Mm -hmm. its own characteristics Mm -hmm. with them. And drug abuse is just one part of it. Um, Because as you know, other Mandalus I would say, we are are the bubble of a community. We are the macrocosm of the world. So whatever that things happening in the world and the universe, the energy come back to us and we somehow somewhere get affected Mm -hmm. um so you know this is very complicated and i am very happy that you mentioned uh, that there will be some network and work will be done and perhaps you will do something starting from next month the reason i say it's complicated alan it's a lot of it goes back to the childhood, okay? 
um, the upbringing, the way the child is raised, that cause a broken family. Just look at the, at the rate of the divorces, even in Baba community and so forth. Um, so, and Baba talks about it in, in the Beyond Words. It's so, now that it's legalized, it's so easy to get hold of it. And mm, the worst part of it is that people take it as a remedy for their, their depression, their loneliness, they don't have friends, they don't have anybody to talk to and that, that, that you know. And um, just like the way people take food, you know, and they wonder why are they uh, so fat and this and that, <laughs> you know, they take it to change their mood and that's yeah. worse. Mm -hmm. So uh, how, how is it possible? You know, I think about this a lot because I have observed some kids and my son just, uh, you know, graduated from high school and he's in second year of college. And so through his friends and all this, and you know, guess what? Even when you think that your kid's in the best school, it's a most wonderful um, school district and whatnot, because they have money, they have more, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, resources to get hold of these drugs. And at the other hand, the drug dealers and some others who wants to make money out of the cash, you know, with the cash business and this and that, are all over these kids and provide it. So it's, you know, it's, <coughs> and they live, and, and the part I want to emphasize, and Baba talks about it, the kids and their level of acceptance. I mean, you throw Baba's words on them. Yeah, I mean, you just read it to them and what is not gonna go through. I mean, um, it may and it may not, but the, the question of being close to them, the relatedness and, and, and so forth is much simpler and more effective perhaps than Baba's quote to begin with. And once they develop their sense of discernment as to what's good and what's bad, perhaps Bobo's quotes helps them to elevate their consciousness and their mood and whatnot. Uh, I talked a lot, uh, uh, so I just want to hear your point of view is how to go about this millennial generation. It is, <clears throat> it is complicated. It's very complicated. It not only can relate to childhood upbringing, it can relate to past lives. It yeah. has nothing to do with childhood. And I think you're right. There's, there's things we know that are protective factors against serious drug abuse. One is accepting loving relationships, family and otherwise. Certainly acceptance is important. Uh, acceptance even of people who are terribly addicted because you've got to relate to the deepest part of them. Uh, <clears throat> number two, a big protective factor is meaning and purpose. Millennials are floundering a little bit. Remember at when we were their age, we pretty much knew what we wanted to do. Right now, it's lucky if they know what they want to do at age 30. Uh, you know, uh, so the big, the big question that one can always ask to people is, how are these drugs helping you do what you really want? And so the notion of what they really want is very important because people who have strong purpose are very involved, whether it's sports or spirituality or relationships, drugs will, or music, Pete Townsend, for example, it gets in your way. But if you have no way, then it seems amusing. Now, the other thing is that 
sooner or later, almost all, all children misbehave in one way or another. Uh, now they're just, they're, they're just behaving strangely later. Uh, aging helps. And so one has to have hope because these, some of us, some of us were really much worse in our day <laughs> than they are today. Uh, and uh, we, have to, we have to understand that also. So we have to be there for, we have to be there for them. We have to help them as much as we can, but we also have to know our limits. So you can't take on all the problems of the world or all the problems of your children, right? You've done that for thousands of lives. You can't do it, you know, enough is enough. You do what you can do and you leave the, the rest to Baba. And uh, it, it usually works, it usually works out, but your observations about who I think are very, very perceptive. And it is not a simple, it is not a simple thing. And substance abuse is only one part of a generational domain. And, and it's, it's, it's that missing thing. Uh, <clears throat> you, uh, for, for a Bible lover, for example, it's easy because no matter what's going on, they understand that their connection with Baba is more important than <clears throat> doing something that's really stupid. I mean, really stupid. We all do stupid things. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, they also have, they understand on some level that you've been able to survive. Uh, and the fact that you've been able to survive, that the parents have been able to survive and have had immense life crises, life and death crises, and they're still around and they're connected and they know that their lives have purposes. Uh, that's a very, very strong thing. So we want to encourage, in other words, we want to encourage if we can, the millennials or others to really get involved in something, hope maybe a service activity, it could be environmental, it could be climate change, it could be politics. But that sense of engagement is a, a fairly good immune mechanism about getting either too drunk or too stoned because it gets in one's way. Well, thank you for a wonderful question. Thank you.